Okay, um, so we're on First John, and um, today we're going to be starting a little mini mini series in First John, um, fellowship with God, having fellowship with God. What is that? And I want us to turn to First John, chapter one. We're only going to be reading actually one verse today. We're going to be having a series for about maybe over a month on just one verse. On just one verse. First John chapter 1. Um, and we're going to be on verse 3, but um, <clears throat> I want us to... Um, we'll be reading verses 1 through... Uh, four. Okay, I'll be reading the Word of God. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld and touched with our hands concerning the Word of Life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you may also have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. In these things we are writing so that our joy may be complete. Let's pray. <clears throat> oh dear, mighty Father, loving Father, we just ask that you would enter this room, but more importantly, enter our hearts and do not let us leave the same, Father. Don't let us leave the same. Your word is so powerful, Father. It's filled with power. Make sure that we leave tonight having that power reach into our hearts and change us. And please, Holy Spirit of God, we just ask that you would take the Father's love and pour it into our hearts tonight. Pour out the Father's love into our hearts tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay. So, 1 John 1.3, um, this is really important, and I want us to interact. Um, if anyone has any questions, raise your hand. We're just in a different room today. Um, so we can have that same sort of interaction, though it's a different kind of setting. Um, we're we're going to be focusing on those words. Can someone read 1 John 1.3 again? Someone read that. Someone read that verse and just look at the series we're going to be starting on. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father. Someone read that. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that was. First John 1 3, not John 1 3. Oh. <laughs> First John 1 3. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also that you may also have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Okay. Look at those words. Uh, and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. There's three questions I have regarding our <clears throat> text for today. What is fellowship with the Father? 
how do we have fellowship with the Father? And what does the Father do in our lives to deepen our fellowship with Him? Three questions we're going to be tackling today. And um, this week, and also probably next week, we're going to be talking about the first person of the Trinity, God the Father. Our Father. You know, a question we can have right now as we're seated here is, how do you view God? Dear believer, how do you view him? Is he, do you view him as a father? Do you view him more importantly as your father? Or is he some distant being out in the universe who sits on his throne and every now and then he speaks with you and he barely smiles at you? Do you see him as not the father, but your father? Or is he your father? That's a more important question. Is he your father? Because it says in John 1, 12. You know, there's a, there's a lot of people who say this. Everyone's a child of God. No, they're not. No, they're not. And, we, and if anyone speaks like that, we can't speak like that. Everyone says, everyone's a child of God. No, they're not. First John 1, 12 says this. To those who receive Jesus Christ, God gave them the right to become children of God. So the only people who are true believers... Truly children of the Father are those who have received Christ, who have believed in Christ. So this series is a series for those who are truly children of God. And people who are truly children of God are people who have truly believed in Christ. What do you guys think on what fellowship with God is? Anyone want to just throw out anything? What do you think that is? Fellowship with God. I think it's like uh, communication. Okay. Com he's saying communication with God. Okay. Anyone else? Could be brainstorming. Walking in his way, in your way, and having, being fulfilled in him. So whenever we say, hey, let's gather together and let's have fellowship with one another, <clears throat> horizontal fellowship with one another, what we're talking about is an engagement between two parties, right? That's what we're talking about. Let's go have fellowship together. Engagement between two parties. Communication, right? When you're having fellowship with other believers, you're talking to them. That's simple. You're talking to them. There's a nearness between two parties. Um, you're listening and you're speaking as well. So the person, let's say two brothers here or two sisters here go to have fellowship. There's a part where you're listening. There's a part where the other person's speaking and you get to speak as well. So fellowship is a two-way street. We have to understand that. It's receiving and giving. Receiving and giving. And um, this series of communion with God, fellowship with God, is going to be about um, fellowship with God in prayer, in secret prayer, in prayer with you and God. I'm not saying you go throughout your day and as you're walking, you're talking to Him. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what Jesus did in His life almost every single day. It says in Luke, He would often slip away and go to an isolated place and pray. I'm talking about that type of prayer. And a question to ask ourselves is, before we get into this is, if you look at your life, do you have that in there? Now, I'm not talking about you go throughout your day and pray, but do you have times set apart to meet with God? And I think a lot of us would say, no, I don't. I don't have that. I kind of just go throughout my day. We have a time where we set apart time for reading, but not so much that prayer aspect. And isn't it crazy? That was so jammed into our Lord's life. He had to slip away and be with his father. 
So fellowship with God, guys, communion with God, communion can be defined as this, communion with God. Experiencing the union you have with God. You can't experience that fellowship if you're not a child of God. So having this fellowship with God is a father, the father and his children experiencing um, intimacy with one another, enjoying his presence. That's what fellowship with God is, enjoying his presence, relishing your soul in him, savoring him, finding your soul's delight in him. Not in the things that he gives you, but in him. You see? That, that's, that's the thing. It's, that's, what, that's what this series is on. How do we have that relationship with God himself so that it's sweet beyond words? As Messiah read, with joy inexpressible. Making your heart skip a beat because you're tasting the glory of God. And you're tasting and you see that the Lord is good. A lot of people say God is good, but only the true believer has tasted and seen that God is good. So communion and fellowship with God is tasting, experiencing, like relishing your soul in who God is. And he's the most satisfying being in all the universe. Do you believe that? You see, that, that's the thing. It's us having this fellowship, one-on-one, -on -one, secret, private prayer with the most satisfying being in the entire universe. And there's no way we can just do one study on this and move on. We're going to go week after week. And my goal is that all of us would implement this in our lives, that we would meet with our Father that's what that's our first question what is fellowship with the father right it's experiencing that sweet union between the two relishing your soul in him enjoying his presence we're talking about the father god the father now how do we have fellowship with god the father because if you guys notice in the verse first john 1 3 there is a distinct difference that John mentions. Our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. One God, there's a trinity though, three distinct personalities, and they have fellowship with the Father, and they have fellowship with the Son, and we will get around to having fellowship with the Spirit. You need to know that this is what's going on. And there's a wonderful book I've been reading, Communion with God by John Owen. It's been so helpful. So, how do we have fellowship with the first person of the Trinity? We're talking about the first person of the Trinity. This week, probably next week. With God the Father. God, you guys, myself, and God the Father. He's called the Father in the verse, 1 John 1, 3, and our fellowship is with the Father. And um, if we want to have true, soul-satisfying fellowship with the first person of the Trinity, we must, must, must have a biblical view on God the Father. I'm sure everyone can relate to this, that we view, uh, at times you can fall into the place of viewing the Father as grim, cold, distant, dry, harsh, condemning, who, who barely cracks a smile at you. That's often a view we can have of the Father, the most dry being ever. We just barely, you know, he, he's, he's just bears with us because his son did that cross thing and he's just, whatever, I gotta love him now. 
That couldn't be further from the truth. We never say that, but we feel that way. We might not think like that soberly, but we feel that way. Especially after you've sinned. That couldn't be further from the truth. And each member of the Trinity is unique in his own way. Let me tell you guys something. You know what the Father is primarily known for? Anyone want to take a guess? I want to say, I'm curious to see if anyone knows this. What is the, in the New Testament, what is the God, what is God the Father primarily known for? What is he marked by? I, I feel like I, the word mercy is used the most. Like, Father, of course, Jesus is a lot. Okay, anyone else? Anyone else want to take a guess? No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say like election, predestined the truth. Okay. I was going to say love. The first person of the Trinity, God the Father, is primarily marked by his love. By his love. Turn to 2 Corinthians 13, 14. And can I get somebody to read this? 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. And I want to say this. We're going to be reading some verses. I'm going to be reading some verses. And you need to know that usually when in our Bibles, in our New Testaments, we see the word God, it's primarily referring to the Father, right? As Messiah said, for God so loved the world, he sent his only son. It doesn't say for the Father loved the world, because we know it's talking about the Father. So those words, God, can be interchangeable with the Father. And that's important as we go on with these verses. But someone read 2 Corinthians 13, 14. What happens in this verse is Paul is ascribing to each member of the Trinity something unique. Someone read that. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Love is distinctly ascribed to God the Father. In John 16, whenever Jesus is in the Last Supper, um, Jesus says this. We have this view often that it's like, the only reason why the Father loves us is because Jesus, you know, he died on the cross and now like the Father has to do it. <clears throat> and look what he says in, in the Last Supper. I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you. He's basically saying, hey, I don't need to get in the picture for him to love you. He himself already loves you. How about John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Right? So loved. Who's that ascribed to? The Father. The Father so loved before Jesus came to this world. How about 1 John chapter 3, verse 1? See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. You see that? See how great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. How about Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5? But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. In love, He predestined us. Who is He? The Father. In love, He did that. And in Romans, Romans chapter 8, it says the Holy Spirit does something. There's something that's unique to the Holy Spirit. It's one of His operations that He does. You know what it is? The love of God has been poured out into our hearts. Through the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit does is he takes whose love? The first person of the Trinity's love and pours it out into the hearts of true believers. True believers. The Spirit is known for taking the Father's love and pouring it out in those who are truly his. 
and go listen to this this is like it's almost the bible is yelling over and over again the father is love first john chapter 4 verses 8 through 11 turn there please turn there i want you to look at this one and someone read this one nice and loud emphasizing it um, that god is love who's god the first person of the trinity the father first john chapter 4 verses 8 through 11 The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us, and he sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And then whenever you get to that verse where it says... Um, what does it say? What's the wording? We did not love him first, he loved us. What does that verse say? We love him because he first loved us. We love because who? He, the Father, loved us. He's marked. And Paul marked him in 2 Corinthians. We read that verse. 2 Corinthians 13, he's distinctly grace to the Lord Jesus Christ, fellowship to the Spirit, and love to the Father. So why did I mention all this? If you want to have personal, sweet fellowship with the first person of the Trinity, you have to know who it is you're having fellowship with. You have to know who it is you're having fellowship with. The chief and only way you can have fellowship with God the Father is to have fellowship with the Father in love. Were you going to mention John 17, 23? Can you say it? Uh, you, Jesus in his prayer to the Father, he said, you have loved them as you have loved me. Oh yeah, there you, you go. Know, yeah. like, it's, it's crazy, it's not just that he just loves us, it's to the same degree that he loves his own son. Yeah, you, heard, you hear that? Yeah. You have loved them as you have loved me. The same <clears throat> amount God the Father loves Jesus Christ is the same amount he loves true believers. It's so hard to believe. It's very hard to believe. <laughs> Listen, you need to be fully assured in your heart that the Father loves you personally. Never doubt it. Never doubt it. John Owen says this, Until the love of the Father is received, we have no communion with the Father in love. You guys understand this? That view of God that you have that's all grim and serious and dark and condemning, that's not God the Father. So you can't have communion as long as you have those thoughts in your head. There is an impossibility of having sweet, soul-satisfying communion where you're filled with joy inexpressible if you have that view of God, because that's not Him. Your thoughts matter when it comes to having and enjoying and tasting this God. You have to understand that. You will never experience the sweet fellowship if you have a harsh, austere dry distant view of the father never put it down this is a series and we're tackling question number two how do we have fellowship with the father you need to get this down if you want to go home and have fellowship with the father you need to understand if you have a harsh austere view of him dear believer it's impossible it is impossible let me say this the Father has multiple attributes. The traumatic holiness he has. The holiness of God is traumatic to Sarah. He's, he, he also has wrath. Not the true believer. But he's also, one, it's one of his attributes, wrath, justice. How about his, the eternality of God? 
that he has existed always? How about the immensity of God, that he's everywhere at all times? Listen, believer. You must never view the first person of the Trinity absent from his love. Never view his other attributes apart from his love. If you do, you're officially out of sync with having fellowship with the Father. Whenever you think about the eternality of God and the immensity of God and the holiness of God, that cannot bring you into sweet fellowship with the Father if you view those attributes apart from his love. That only scares sinners. That only terrifies us, even as, even as believers. If you want to have fellowship and you're thinking about how vast and eternal God is, you have to think how vast and eternal my Father is. My loving Father is eternal and vast. You're never supposed to view the Father's attributes apart from His love. So, in order to have true fellowship with the Father, you must, you must make sure that, view, that you view Him primarily through the lens of love. Because that's what he repeatedly reveals himself as and marks himself by. It's by no accident that he does that. It's by no accident that he does that. John Owen says this, As long as the Father is seen as harsh, judging, and condemning, the soul is filled with fear and dread every time it comes to him. And, that's, and this is why that we really need to throw our feelings away. It doesn't matter if you don't feel his love for you. You have to believe it. You have to accept it. You just have to have faith and receive, no matter how you feel, believe it. He loves you. He loves you. Jesus told, go ahead. Uh. What should believers do, like, let's say, if, if, if believers are trying to to view that, but get taught to, no, if you're not saved, this doesn't apply to you. So, like, I guess insurance attacks or... Yeah. Because that can be a struggle with a believer knowing they're saved, but still viewing it that way. But then there might be someone that views that because they're unsure if they're a child of God or not. Right. So when we get those attacks, what should we do? Like, to, you know, or if that's maybe that's for the topic for us. Yeah, I can, I can, I can briefly comment on that because he, he's mentioning a good thing. Bahag mentioned something good. If you're not a true Christian, God does have wrath towards you. He does have a holy hatred upon you. That's what it says in the Bible. So he's bringing a good question. He's like, what if I don't know if I'm a true believer? Right? It's like fierce, ferocious wrath. And then the most tender love on those who are believers. If Christ is your only hope of going to heaven, throw it away. If, if Jesus Christ is your only hope of going to heaven, accept his love for you. And end it there. You have to end it there. Sticking to the facts and throwing away those feelings, throwing away those darts that come in your mind and standing by faith, living by faith. Jesus told a parable in Matthew chapter 25 called the parable of the talents. And then it's a story where this manager, he's uh, going off to a far land and he calls some people to him, his slaves, and he gives them certain talents, the money, and they have to go make business of this thing. And then when he comes back, he'll reward them. Well, the first one, he had five talents, he made 10. The second slave had two talents, he made four. What happened to the last one? He got one talent, how many did he make? He made none. Why? What did he say? Okay, did you hear that? The words in Matthew 25, the, the, the master comes back and he's like, all right, I want to see what you guys made. 
five made 10, the guy who had two made four. The guy who got one, he says these words. And the one also who received the one talent came and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. In the story, that's a non-believer. Okay? In that story, that's a non-believer. But for some believers in this room, you honestly and regularly feel the same words. You think of God and you honestly say the same words that wicked slave did. I knew you to be a hard man. Let me tell you something. Was he a hard man or not? He was not a hard man. You know why? You know why the master was not a harsh master? Because he gave talents to five people. And whenever that, that person who had five talents came back to him, he says this to him. I entrusted you with few things. I'm going to give you many things. He's the most gracious master. He's the most loving master. He abundantly gives. But we have to understand this believer, when those harsh thoughts come in and you think of God that way, you're thinking like that wicked, lazy slave. Did the master react with, oh, don't worry, it's fine. He got upset when that slave thought about him that way. I knew you to be a hard man. You can feel that way. Oh, Father, I know, I know you're a hard man. And believer, you will not be productive in the kingdom of God if you have a view of God like that. You know why? Because that slave, how much did he do for the kingdom? Nothing. Nothing. And so same way, if you don't have that sweet view, that kind and compassionate view of God the Father, you will also be ineffective. You will also be ineffective. There is nothing that hurts the heart of God the Father more than when, than when his own children view him as an austere tyrant. Did you guys hear that? There is nothing that hurts the Father's heart more than when you and I have those subconsciously harsh thoughts of us. And not only that, there is nothing that advances Satan's kingdom more than viewing the Father like this. Satan himself rejoices when he can fill your heart with such thoughts of the Father. Unfortunately, I have to say that some of us believers in this room have been living in the jaws of Satan himself for a long time now, and you don't even know it. What do I mean by that? Satan's oldest trick in his book, you know what it is? It's to give God's people harsh and distorted views of the Father. Do you know how Adam and Eve fell? Do you not understand what Satan did to them? They were right before the tree that they weren't, they were told not to eat from. Two true believers. And Satan comes and he says this to Eve. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You know what's the first thing Satan did to God's people? He gave them a distorted, harsh view of the Father. Whenever you think those thoughts of God the Father, know there's a satanic attack going on in your mind. Because that's the, his oldest trick in the book. That's his oldest trick in the book that he has. It's to give us um, that harsh view of the Father. Satan looks at some of us in this room 
and rejoices greatly that his old trick still works till this day. That's what I meant by there are some of us who are living in the jaws of Satan. Because he rejoices every time he looks at you. Because you know what he's thinking? I get him every time. <laughs> I get him every time. That's an old trick. Like, I had a great victory that day in the garden. And it still happens till this day. Same God's people. And the same trick keeps on having them have the most harsh views of profanity. And we need to wake up from that. We have to wake up from that. When the true believer begins to view their father as cold and condemning, two things happen. Satan and his demons begin to grin with the wildest smile, the widest smile imaginable. And two, you break your father's heart and move him to tears. You break your father's heart and move him to tears. You know, I'm afraid why many of us are guilty of grieving the father's heart with these harsh thoughts of him. You know how I know that? Majority of us read our Bibles daily but neglect secret time with God in prayer. I'm, I'm going to repeat that. One way you can know that Satan has already begun influencing your heart towards God is that you will be disciplined to have your Bible reading, but you will not set a time aside and meet with God in secret communion prayer. Here's why. Because we don't view our Father as desirable to spend time with Him. How unwilling is a child to come into the presence of an angry father? Do you see that? How unwilling is a child to come into the presence of an angry father? Which child will run into the arms of a father who is cold, mean, and harsh? Who will do that? So same way, if you desire to see the sweetness and the love that the Father has for you, who are you having fellowship with? That's like really, I'm like realizing how much that's happened in my life or seasons that I like didn't have that view of God. I would be, I would want to pray as like uh, praying so much. I would want to pray about everything, every detail, every decision, every step I take I, I wanted to pray like it wasn't like I was like, denying myself to like discipline myself to pray like it was so natural and then in the seasons that I have that this wrong view of God I'm just like you know you have to like I have to like force myself to pray because it's the right thing to do or like you know I'm, I don't talk in detail to with him and it's literally that like you know it just hit me that that's what it is because I can remember the times and how I was doing that John Owen in the book Communion with God says if you have a proper view of the Father and His love for you, you won't be able to spend an hour away from Him. And the reason why we have gone in our Christian life and said, yeah, I'll read verses a day, I'll, I'll do my Bible reading, but not take time to be alone with God in prayer is because deep down, believer, you view Him as undesirable. Because as Vahak said, The heart of every true believer is wired in this way. The more they experience God's love, they can't bear to be away from Him. But whenever you tell a false Christian God loves you, do you know what they say? Great, let's go sin and party all we want. He loves us. But the true believer is moved closer to Him. That's what the Father's love does to us. And you have to recognize that that's the root issue. Either you're not a believer, and God's love does only motivates you to sin more freely, or you're a believer who has neglected this loving view of God for so long that you can go hours, days, weeks without talking to Him in secret prayer. We have this view, guys, and we need to stop it. That Jesus and His time on earth, He would spend hours in prayer with God by himself in a secluded place 
One time it says in Luke, he spent all night in prayer with his father. Listen, guys. Some people, we can become almost so spiritual and say like, well, he was a man. So if, if he wanted to live perfectly, he had to depend upon his father for just that grace to live. Well, that's true. And they're like, they, they say something like this. Well, Jesus was, um, he needed that time with the father. Why don't we ever think that he wanted that time with the father? You see, why don't we ever think of it that way? That the reason why Jesus Christ spent the majority every single day, the best hours of his day in communion and fellowship with his God in private prayer. Why don't we think that maybe he did that because he wanted to? Because God the Father's love is so satisfying to the human soul that he couldn't bear go the entire night in prayer apart from it. Whenever you see the kindness and beauty of God the Father's love, his loveliness and his kindness and compassionate heart, you know what will be better? You, like Jesus, will say, I don't even want to sleep. Better I stay up all night praying with this soul-satisfying experience. The greatest unkindness you can do to the Father is to not believe that He loves you. The greatest unkindness you can do to the Father is to not believe that He loves you. Repeat it with me. The greatest unkindness you can do to the Father is to not believe that He loves you. Amen. Amen. And you have to know that. You really have to know that. I have a question. Yeah. Um, what is um, prayer in secret? Like, what is the difference with prayer and prayer? You go home tonight and put the phone away. Whatever comfortable position you want to go in, either laying down in your bed, and you speak with God. That's it. Think of it if you're speaking to a, another person. It's not a, it's not some far entity that you have no connection with. Is the ultimately loving person. And in that time, when we do go home, if we do, and you go and, and want to spend time with the Father, <clears throat> the baseline is. You have to receive and accept he is who he is he's as lovely as he is and that his heart is filled with immense love for you and we said fellowship is a two-way street right and in that enjoyment you talk to him that's it simple unpack your heart to him while knowing who you're talking to we don't talk to a distant man sitting on a throne who barely smiles but God the Father, your Father, and you must view Him as your Father. You see? Your Father. Is that not the sweetest thing ever? The, the God of the universe is my Father. My Abba. And I'm His Son. Tell me how long you can go without talking to your parents. And see if they'll say something to you. You see? You go three weeks without talking to them. Quality time with parents. Or let's say when let's say I don't I don't know if anyone here has children. I don't think you do. Um, how would you feel if your son just barely goes, son or daughter goes months, weeks without having a quality conversation with you? We would want that. Our fathers would want that. How much more does God the Father want that? Did anyone want to say something? Did I see a hand? Uh, I was just going to say, I was just going to add that. Recognize that there are no rules either. They, like, we are given so much freedom in uh, how we come to God the Father. You know, it doesn't say you must be on your knees and you must be facing north and there are no set rules. It's not like Islam where you have to yeah. wear gloves and face it. You know, uh, so it's it's very free. Uh, 
I would say the only thing, the only principle to have in mind is, again, recognize who you're talking to. Yes, he loves you far more than we can fathom, but also recognize you are speaking to the eternal, majestic, glorious God, and that should fill you with a good fear, you know, reverence. So it's not like I'm going to go to him, hey, Dad, you know, I, I, speak with, I speak with him openly, but with reverence, recognizing who he is. Yeah. Luke 15, the prodigal son story. If Jesus had to describe God the Father in one way, you know what story would you tell him? Why don't you turn there? Go to Luke 15. Listen to this story. The story where the prodigal son leaves, makes a wreck of his father's estate. And then whenever he had no money, he had no money. <clears throat> He comes back home, saying, what am I going to do? At least let me go back to my father and see what he'll do to me, if he'll accept me. And this is Jesus describing the one he had sweet fellowship with. This story in Luke 15 is the most accurate description of how God the Father is towards believers. Luke 15, I'll read from verses um, 20 to 24. So he rose up and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. And let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. You see, when you truly placed your faith in Christ, oh, it wasn't the angels who were making the most noise in heaven. Oh, it was the father. And the word for he kissed him here is not just like a very slow way to grabbing him and just drowning him in kisses and tears. But that's how the Father views us. That's how the Father views you. Just longing to grab you. He was on the lookout to see his Father coming. And that's the same way with you. You should think about that. That whenever you put a time and say, all right, Father, I'm going to have some communion with you. You best believe that the Father is off looking at a distance and he'll run to you in that time of fellowship. He will run to you. And as if all over again, the second you decide I'm going to have fellowship with my Father, he's going to come once again, fresh as always, with hugs, kisses, drowning with tears, with blessing. You give it to him. He cuts you off because he just can't wait to give you more and more love. And then he says, let's go celebrate and dance and sing. Believer, when you sin and you confess to God, you just know that the moment of your confession, he grabs you and kisses you one more time. Zephaniah 3.17. You know what the Father is doing to true believers at this very moment? The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will exalt over you with louder singing. The true believer, when God the Father's eyes are on you, just the sight of you, causes him to burst out in loud singing. And in those songs, he's expressing his deep love for you. Loud singing. And it says he quiets you by his love. Such great love. This is why John says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, see how great a love the Father has lavished upon us. See how great love. The Father has lavished upon us. He's so in love with us. The 
most importantly, you have to know that he's so in love with you and that he sings over you and that he kisses and embraces you. And that's the person you're supposed to speak with when you're by yourself, laying on your bed at night, knowing that when it's 2 a.m., it's quiet. Oh, in heaven, he's singing about you. And in the light of that knowledge, communion begins when you receive his love for you and that you respond in gratitude and love back to him. Fill your heart with love, his love, the first person of the Trinity's love. And communion will begin once you're receiving it and that joy comes upon you and you respond with gratitude, tears, you're talking to him, unpacking your heart for as long as you want. That's what Jesus did. You want to say something? I was going to say, I think, like, I feel like the reason we might have that view a lot too is because, like, of the false churches or false teachers that overly <coughs> focus on God's love in the wrong way, and, like, we want to, like, stand against that and emphasize his holiness and his wrath because a lot of people don't seem to, like, see that. Versus, like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Like, we avoid it because it's like people took it out of context so much. But, like, it's, it's still it's a truth in the Bible, you know? So, I feel yeah. like that's a big reason why I have this high struggle with it. Oh, yeah. Hard preaching, if heard too much, can actually cause doubts of salvation. You could cause these dark thoughts of your God. Oh, man, guys. Oh, how sweet the Father is. Really. Your human soul was made to experience that love and that fellowship. This is the reason why we were saved. It wasn't just that we had to be saved from hell. The reason why Jesus died on the cross was so that we can experience this intimacy with him after we were saved. Last question. What does the Father do in our lives to deepen our fellowship with Him? What does God the Father do in our lives to deepen our fellowship with Him? Someone read 1 John. Let's all turn there. I'll turn there. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 16. What does the Father do in our lives to deepen our fellowship with Him? 1 John 2, 15 to 16. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Why did I mention that? Whenever I'm asking the question, how can we deepen our fellowship with God? What does God do in our lives to deepen our fellowship? I look at this verse. It says, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Love for the world chokes out the loveliness of the Father. The more you love the world, the more you love the lusts and pleasures of the world, there's no room in your heart for the love and loveliness of God. Because your heart is so filled with the opposite of the sweetness of God. The people who really love themselves too much, obsessed over their looks, 
really, they just adore themselves. The sad thing is that they've replaced that love. They've replaced that pleasure instead of experiencing the pleasures that can be experienced with God. The more we have of the world, love of the world, love of sin and pleasure and lusts and vanity and self, we're filling our hearts so much that the saddest thing is we're not able to experience the sweetness and beauty of God. That's the reason why people, that's the reason why all of us guys are not head over heels panting to go home to be with the Father because there's other things that we're satisfied with ourselves, sin, and the world. So, what does the Father do in our lives to deepen our fellowship with Him? He will bring suffering into our lives. This lovely Father who sings over us will bring suffering into our lives. God will bring suffering into our lives so that we can better enjoy who He is. God is so concerned with having us see him as the father of love that he will bring suffering into our life. You might be like, what? That's a contradiction towards what love is. What loving father would bring suffering into the lives of their child? We might think like that. Isn't that the opposite of what a loving father does to bring suffering into the hearts of their children? No. Because suffering weans the heart of its affections to the world and broadens and widens the eyes of our heart to experience more of God. Suffering pries off our affections for the world. That's what it's meant to do in the believer's life. It's supposed to pry off those pleasures that your heart wants, your heart loves, and open a door for you to have and experience higher depths of the loveliness and sweetness of God the Father. That's what it is. You're prying something off to open a door so that you can more clearly see the Father's love for you. That's what suffering is for in our life. You have to see any type of trial, any type of suffering, any type of sickness, any type of death of a loved one, any type of even pain as God's loving hand given to you so that you can experience more of him, so that more of his loveliness can enter your heart. It's just like whenever you're a parent and then your, your child is, in a, is attached to something that's not good. So you take it away from them. Why? Because you're evil? No, because you want to give them something better. And the father sees that we're so in love with the world. We have so many things that attract us. Oh, I want to make this much money. Oh, I, want to, I want to live in a mansion. I want, to, I want to be posting about this. I want to be posting about that. I'm going to be doing this. And the father sees that. He's like, oh, my son, my daughter, you're missing out. You don't know. You're attracted to those things and you shouldn't be attracted to them. But in my love, I'm going to send suffering into your life so that I can pry those things off of you to give you more of me. And you are created to experience me. Suffering in the believer's life is an opportunity to have deeper, sweeter, lovelier fellowship with God. And believers, you have to view any type of suffering in your life in that light. You have to, whenever suffering comes your way, not think, oh man, like, what kind of God do I have? No. What kind of God do I have? That He's giving me more opportunity to taste more of Him, to drink more of Him, to see that He created me for this purpose. Do you understand that 
Do you know why the devil made sin attractive? Do you know why Satan makes sin pleasurable? It's because he wants to get your eyes off an even better player. Amen? The reason why lust, vanity, all these things are pleasurable is because the devil knows that you were made to have the sweetness, the pleasures of God satisfy your soul, and he doesn't want that. If sin wasn't pleasurable, he's stupid. The reason why sin is pleasurable, pleasurable is because he's trying to take your mind away from what you were created for. This is not for some people, it's for everyone. If you're a human, you have to understand that you were made to find your satisfaction in God. Not the things that God gives you, but in God. In Him. In Him. Because there is such sweetness in who He is. There's such sweetness. And he's, He made you so that you can experience that sweetness. But sin gets in the way. And in our lives, sin gets in the way. And what does God do? My son, my daughter, how much do I want you to be satisfied with me? So I'm going to bring suffering into your life so that I can make this world more bitter to you and so that you can see me as more sweet, more desirable. Um, lately, I've been going through some trials and stuff, but um, I was mentioning to Bahaj about it, and he was having a beautiful verse from James chapter 1, 2. Uh, he's sending it in the group that too, but I just want to mention it again. Um, it says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the <coughs> testing of your faith produces endurance, and that endurance has its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Amen. So, that this is like almost every day, God. Reading before going to work. Good, good. There's a lot of things going on, you know. Meditating on this verse is beautiful. Yeah. Guys, even if there's any bodily pain in your life, get in the habit of pleading with God. Please show me more of your glory and your character and your love in this suffering. Because that's what it's meant to do. Don't, whenever suffering comes in your life, don't always view it as a curse. Oh my goodness, believer, it's a, the greatest gain for you because God ordained it. Amen? God, we sang, you're sovereign over all. He's sovereign over the pain in your teeth. He's sovereign over the death of that loved one. He's, suffer, he's sovereign over that breakup. And he's sovereign over the cancer from him because he's sovereign over all you know in psalms uh psalm 84 um a lot of no good thing does he withhold from those who walk rightly no good thing psalm 145 uh, the lord does good to all and his mercies are over all his works uh, he is kind in all his ways yes. and righteous in all his deeds so just keeping those in mind as a general principle whenever you see these sufferings in your life the motive behind them, who is sovereign over all, and he ordains everything that takes place, knowing why he's doing it. Yeah. Please pray when you're in suffering. Show me more of your glory. Please pray that when you have pain of any kind. Be in the make that a routine of things in your life. There's a story of a believer who was a. Um, People from Scotland. They were believers from Scotland. And um, this believer, they were Scottish Covenanters. He had uh, been arrested, I believe, for, I guess, something Christianity related. And um, they had given him, I think, seven mortal wounds. What's a mortal wound? Does anyone know? Huh? Paper cut? <laughs> Quite probably the opposite of a paper cut. A mortal wound is something that can kill you if inflicted into you. 
okay? So one, the definition of a mortal wound is something that holds the capability if like a hammer behind someone's head, like hard enough, that would be a mortal wound. This guy received seven and he was still alive. And they threw him and his shattered, destroyed body in a dungeon with the rest of his brothers in Christ. And he was on the floor just bleeding out. And on top of that, they took heavy chains and threw it on him. And his believer friends are witnessing all of this. And you know what he said? These were the words that were coming out of his mouth. I don't think I can bear up under this much longer. That's what he was saying. I don't think I can bear up under this much longer. And when his friends asked him what he, what he was saying, they realized that he wasn't talking about the pain. That at that moment, the glory of God, the loveliness and sweetness and love of God was being poured out in that man's heart so badly that that's what he was talking about. I don't know if I can bear up under this glory much longer. He wasn't talking about the pain. Seven mortal wounds. And as a true believer, we have to understand that suffering is a, is a gateway towards bliss in who God is. Bliss. It's the greatest gift he can give you to lead you closer to himself and his love. I recently watched a documentary called Unrest of a disease called ME. ME. It's a long name, right? It's an inflammation of the, the brain and the spinal cord. And people with this condition um, are, it affects their body in this way. They can't do what you're doing right now. Their body does not produce the, enough ATP to do the smallest amount of things. So they always feel as if they just ran a marathon, crossed the finish line and collapsed all the time. Doing this for them in severe cases is equivalent of running a marathon. Their body is not producing enough ATP to do the smallest amount of tasks. And I'm watching this documentary and people who have severe cases of this are bed bound. They're bed bound. Um, and it's crazy. I was watching this documentary and there's, you're seeing these human beings who live normal lives like we did. They went out with their friends. You know, they went to events. They went to the movies. They laughed and, you know, lived life, drove cars, walked out of their house. They're stuck in a room. Four years, eight years, 16 years. They're stuck in a room because their body is not producing enough energy for them to do this. So these people are stuck. And I was watching a video of a man who was a woman who was eight years with this condition. And it, it showed a recording of her father holding her and having her touch the floor next to her bed because she hadn't touched the floor in eight years. And the joy on this, this I don't probably not believe it, but the joy on their face that they touched the floor. And guess what happened afterwards? Her dad put her back to her bed and she crashed. People who suffer from ME have what you call a crash. When they go beyond their limited amount of ATP. So, there's literally a camera of her shaking involuntarily, like having a seizure almost. Because she did something that was too much for her body. What was it? She touched the floor. She touched the floor. 
I watched another guy who was literally frozen in time, laying down, years. They're frozen in time. I asked our sister for permission to talk about this, but we have a sister in South Carolina who suffers from ME, but she's a believer in Christ. Okay, she's a believer in Christ. And not only does she have this atrocious disease at a severe case, but she also has heart problems and other syndromes that just make it a living hell on earth. She's been bed bound for about eight years. Um, and I wanna read some quotes that she said. And I need you to understand this because we're talking about experiencing the glory of God through suffering. She says this, some days I get sad about the things I will never experience, but I am even more sad that most people will never experience and know God the way I have in sickness. I have experienced his consuming love, his supernatural grace, his transforming sanctification, his immeasurable joy and seeing his character in ways I could have never had I had a normal life. Knowing God has been my greatest experience of all. I am so full. I am so at peace, so joyful. I wouldn't trade my experiences in sickness for normal ones. Did you hear that? She's been stuck in bed for eight years and she said that. I wouldn't trade my experiences in sickness for those normal ones. God has given far more than he's taken away. She's been in bed, bed bound for eight years. And she's saying God has given more than he's taken away. If you have a higher, sweeter, more intimate view of God, yet you are bound to a bed for the rest of your life, you are without a doubt more blessed than anyone here who has all of life's normal abilities but lacks that same view of God. Because the human soul was made to find its satisfaction in God. And even if, even if you're bedbound for the rest of your life, some people in that documentary, they were able to say words for five minutes every year. I'm trying to show you that God is enough. I'm trying to show you that your soul was made to experience him. Stop saying if I only have this marriage that I want, then I'll be satisfied. Stop saying that if I get this, then I'll be satisfied. You not understand that Satan is planting those thoughts in your head to keep you away from what your soul was meant to experience. She said this as well, going forward in treatment, I'm not afraid of not getting better and dying a slow, painful death. I fear getting better and not having the spiritual benefits of suffering. There you have a person stuck in bed eight years saying, I fear getting better and losing the spiritual benefits of suffering because she's tasted God. The times I've asked, how can I pray for you? Do you know what she said? Don't pray that I get healed. Pray that I suffer well and that I see God's glory. Because once you've tasted God, believers, once you've tasted that the Father loves you, once you've tasted, experienced the loveliness of God the Father, Everything in this life will become dim to you. Please understand that, guys. Please. How we view our lives. Oh, man. <coughs> this is being taken away from me. This happened. Some people might listen to what I'm saying and be like, what a strong girl. No. No. She said once people say to me a lot, oh, you're such a strong, positive girl. And she says, Are you, you're just trying to puff me up. You're just, that's, a, that's a phrase that we need to throw out. That's pride. She's weak, sinful, 
like the rest of us, but she has a glorious and beautiful God. That's the reason why I mentioned her, not to make a hero out of her, but to point to see that you can have her life circumstances, but if you have a knowledge of God, you have way more than all of us here combined, health-wise, career-wise, marriage-wise, you name it. If you have God, you're the richest person in the entire world. And Jesus taught a parable on the parable of the rich fool. You know what he said? Oh, I have, I have so much money. I have, this is how we think. I have so much money. Okay, year four, I'm going to do this. I'm going to tear down my barns and make bigger ones. I'm going to store all my treasures in this. You know what Jesus says about that man? You fool, this night your soul is demanded of you. One's life is not made in abundance of possessions. And he says, this man was not rich towards God. That's, the, that's what the parable ends with. He wasn't rich towards God. This richness of God is not found in ourselves, my friends. It's found in you having an experiential knowledge of God. I'm sorry that you've been coming to church and you think this is all routine. We gather as friends and we leave it there. No, the point of what we're doing now is that you go home every single time during Bible study knowing and experiencing and savoring more of God. This is what we were made for, guys. She asks me when I say, how can I pray for you? Pray that I suffer well and pray that I see God's glory. Why? Because she recognizes that suffering in the believer's life is one step away from the world and one step closer to having sweeter, more breathtaking, more soul-satisfying experiences of the glory of God. And this is why we're closing out with this. This is why in Jude chapter 1, verse 21, it says this. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Who's God? The Father. Keep yourselves in the love of God. After this, guys, I say this to myself, but let's not leave and begin to meditate more on the love of God and then stop. Please ask him, Lord, would you permanently make this a part of my life? Not something I try for a season and then go back to how I was living. Don't do that with this study, guys. Don't hear what I'm saying and then maybe try it out for a couple days and go back to living your life apart from any communion with the Father. Don't do that. Because you know what you're doing? You're, you're missing out on the greatest joy imaginable and you're chasing after little pleasures. Satan works 24-7, even when you're asleep, so that you don't experience the all-satisfying beauties of God. This is study one, the fellowship with the Father, and how we need to prioritize sweet fellowship with the Father the way Jesus did. The way Jesus did. Let's pray. Oh, Father, oh, lovely Father who's singing in heaven, just ask, please, Father, pour out your love into our hearts. Please keep us in your love. Look ahead, look weeks ahead. Look months ahead. Look years ahead. And please integrate this into our life, Lord. Don't let this something that comes and goes. Lord, Satan will do that. He will allow us to have fellowship a few times with you. And then we'll get lazy and go back to how we were living, Lord. But it's by your grace that we will grow more and more and more closer to you. And I need that, Father. Please look upon us with your great love and give us the greatest gift imaginable. You. We were made to experience you. Now be with us as we worship uh, these last songs, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.